history, and literature. Her many books include Harvey Milk, His Lives and Deaths, and The Gay Revolution. Her latest book, which she joins us to talk about, is called Woman, The American History of an Idea. She joins me over Zoom, Lillian Faderman. It is a great pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. Good to see you again, Mitch. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to see you again. And of course, as we're talking about here, something that has been uh, in the news now and an issue that seems to sort of get around the idea of at least woman today. And we're going to go back to the 17th century and, and work our way through chronologically. But of course, right now, everyone is paying so much attention to this report that the Supreme Court has confirmed that there is a draft majority opinion looking like the court is poised, so that can change, uh, to overturn uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, Obviously, a a third rail issue in in American life seems to be a part of when we talk about ideas of women and women's rights. How do you see abortion when you think of woman as an American idea, the the title of your book. I'm still hoping against hope that this draft will not be what the Supreme Court finally concludes. The struggle for abortion has been going on for uh, many decades before Roe v. Wade. Uh, Finally, with Roe v. Wade, women got the right that they had fought for for so long. And it's concerning that the conservative majority in the Supreme Court are contemplating getting rid of that right. I understand that uh, states will still have the right to make their own laws about abortion. It's just that Roe v. Wade, which gives women the constitutional right to an abortion, will be erased if this decision really does go through, as many of us fear it will. So presently, um, there are 26 states that have on the books uh, these laws that will be triggered once the um, Roe v. Wade is repealed. Uh, There are 24 states in which women would still be able to get an abortion, but women in those 26 states will be out of luck unless they could travel to one of those 24 states. I fear it it will make a huge difference for many women who are not capable for financial reasons or whatever of of leaving their state. Um, Fortunately, there's no talk about getting rid of contraceptives, but as we know, for many women, contraceptives um, are, for one reason or another, not effective or not possible to use. So um, I, I... I'm not going to say that it's going to put women back to the uh, pre-1973 era, but I think for many women, this will make a huge difference. Again, the title of your book is Woman, the American History of an Idea. And you, part of your thesis here in your argument is that woman is the, the idea of, of a woman is a social construction. Uh, construction that's not always and frequently not created by by women themselves. Do you, do you see the issue of abortion in in that way as as part of the construction in this? Not I don't mean the act of abortion. I mean the the battle over abortion and and constructing the idea of a woman in the twentieth century. I I think that that from the beginning a definition of woman as uh, one of the Puritans wrote was that she is, quote, helpful in the propagating of mankind. (laughs) She wasn't even given uh, the large share of credit for for having children, but she was simply helpful in the propagating of mankind. It was so tied to the definition of woman and that women began to challenge it by saying they had a right to not bear children, they had a right to terminate pregnancies, Was uh, it was an earthquake for people way past the 17th century who uh, still honored that definition of woman, that her, her primary role was to be helpful in the propagating of mankind. So this is, this is a link you can find all the way back to the, the, the 17th century. Absolutely, a link. The notion that a, a woman should say, I, I don't want a child, I'm not ready for a child, I can't afford to, 
have another child, I want to make a decision about when I bear children. That that was traumatic for traditionalists who believed that a definition of woman, that her primary role was to, to bear children for men. Your book begins in the 17th century, so we're talking the 1600s. You, you, you refer to this as an American history of the idea. Of course, this is before we have the well, we have the Americas, I suppose, at, at this time. Uh, is, is there something significant about the 17th century that you begin there? Yes. Uh, it, it's when the uh, colonists came to uh, these shores. They uh, met with a culture very different from theirs. The Native Americans viewed women, and I think this was true of most of the tribes, viewed women very differently um, women were, um, in some tribes, uh, given a voice on the tribal councils. Um, women had the right in some tribes over their own body. Um, they could say uh, with whom they would have sexual relations. Um, in some tribes, uh, women uh, made the proposal to the man they desired, uh, and they decided when they wanted to get rid of that man. If they wanted to do that, they simply put his uh, belongings outside of the longhouse, and that was considered a divorce. The Puritans in particular had a very hard time with, with that notion. I tell a story in my book about um, Roger Williams, who uh, had been a high official in the Massachusetts Bay Colony before he broke with them and went to Rhode Island. Um, and he wrote the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, about an incident uh, in Connecticut. And that was that there had been a terrible massacre of a uh, Pequot village in Connecticut. Many men, women, and children were killed and the Pequots uh, wanted to beg for peace, to sue for peace. And they did what they usually did. They sent a woman leader to the uh, colonists to uh, ask if there uh, could be a truce and a uh, peace agreement. Roger Williams wrote to uh, John Winthrop, we questioned her much for her truth and sent her away. They simply couldn't believe that a woman would have that kind of authority. And so the Pequots then sent another woman and the same thing happened. They questioned her much for her truth and sent her away. And then the Pequots sent five women and an old man. And this time the, the colonists were willing to talk, but to the old man, <laughs> they simply ignored the, the five women who were there. So it was just such a, a different relationship that the colonists had to the notion of woman from uh, what so many of the Native American tribes had. You also write about, in, in the early years of the American Republic, when George Washington still president with a program that was called the Civilization Program, and trying to offer tribes to you know, become agrarians uh, and farmers and the Cherokee. And it was always sort of split. It's kind of a complicated story, but a significant number of Cherokee uh, tried to do this and, and, George, and, and the federal government required that women play a specific role. I think even George Washington was instrumental in yes, that. George Washington and then uh, later with Thomas Jefferson. But the uh, story is that the George Washington called the uh, – called together the men of the Cherokee Tribal Council and told them that uh, their women must learn to spin and weave just as the white women did. The reason for that, of course, was that uh, the Cherokee men, as was true with many of the Indian tribes, uh, their job was to, uh, to hunt and to trap and to roam the lands that obviously the new uh, nation of uh, uh, founding fathers thought should uh, be reserved for settlement for white people. Um, and so George Washington told the leaders of the uh, Cherokee, the male leaders, that he would provide women to uh, 
who would teach uh, Cherokee women how to spin and weave. And um, even uh, decades later, uh, that notion continued into the, uh, but during uh, Jefferson's time as well, there was a movement to get uh, uh, Indian women to be domesticated, to do uh, jobs around the house just as white women did so that men, uh, Indian men could take over the agrarian tasks that Indian women had done before. And in the um, 1820s, um, the man who was the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as it was then, talked about how the problem with Indians is that the women weren't sufficiently domesticated and that that would make a difference with Indian men. They, they would learn to cherish the home and, of course, emulate uh, the situation among the, the white people. So, so this idea, this early idea of, of, of woman comes from European colonizers to, to this land. Did you, have, you, have you ever, is it possible to trace where the idea begins and where it comes from in, in Europe? Well, you know, it, I, I think it was uh, true all over Europe that a uh, woman was the second sex and inferior to, to man. But I think that once the Europeans came to this continent and, and thought they were settling the new world, and, and particularly uh, in the New England continents, facing a what they saw as a howling wilderness and what they saw as these strange people, that is, these Native Americans who were already here, they became even more set on uh, asserting um, masculinity, asserting uh, muscle values, and even more set on on making sure that women remained women, um, that woman remained uh, chaste and modest and obedience and gave, as one of the colonists said, subjection to her husband um, and that she not be, uh, as another colonist said, a rash rambler abroad. Um, and women who defied that were punished in various ways. Most famously, of course, uh, Anne Hutchinson, who was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony because she dared to preach. But um, women who were disobedient to their husbands were um, put in the stocks, they were in prison, they were whipped. And this was true not only um, in the uh, Puritan colonies, but uh, in other colonies as well. Um, they uh, uh, were uh, punished by a cleft stick being fastened to their tongue because they uh, uh, had dared to talk back to men or to question uh, in church the, uh, the primacy of the ministers or to question the magistrates. Uh, later on in the 1650s and 1660s, they were hanged for um, uh, not being proper women. Uh, and of course, in the 1690s, most famously, the Salem witch trials that um, victimized primarily women who dared to step out of the role that was appropriate to women. They were shrews. They talked back to their husbands. Uh, they, uh, they tried to do business in the world. And that was enough to very often get them get them being to be accused of being witches and in some cases to be hanged in other cases to be imprisoned. I, I want to know more about your analysis of the witch trial. Then it sounds like it's, it's not, not, not necessarily about witchcraft. I don't think it was necessarily about witchcraft. It was certainly hysteria, but what I discovered is that it was often a uh, hysteria that was triggered by women taking roles that uh, that wasn't deemed appropriate, uh, roles that weren't deemed appropriate to them. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of the trial of uh, Anne Hibbins, uh, when she was first accused and, and uh, brought to court and excommunicated, her husband was still alive and he, he could uh, protect her a little bit, but um, she was accused of, of being a shrew. Uh, she was very upset because she 
um, dealt with some carpenters that she thought cheated her and uh, she she insulted them she uh, fought back she she said that this is uh, uh, this is robbery and she she was a rash rambler abroad and that she even went to a neighboring town where the carpenters had worked and she said that they uh, cheat you too all of this was inappropriate for a woman when her husband died he was no longer there to protect her and she was accused of then not only being a shrew, but also of, of uh, casting spells on people. And ultimately, she was one of the first women uh, to be hanged. Um, other women who, who were accused of witchcraft um, had businesses. They, uh, they were merchants. Uh, there was one who uh, sold, uh, uh, made butter and sold it to uh, 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 sailors, uh, men who were going out on, on ships. She was accused of uh, casting a spell on them through her butter. It was unusual for a woman to be a merchant, for a woman to do business. And so she, she too was uh, accused of being a witch because she had overstepped the boundaries of woman. I, I found one case uh, in particular very interesting of a woman who was accused of witchcraft her husband came to her defense and said, she has borne me 12 children and she has been a fine wife and mother and I, I beg you to release her. And she was released because they, her husband said that she, uh, she did what a woman was supposed to be. She was a fine wife and, and a mother of 12 children, the bearer of 12 children. So I, I think, yes, the, the accusations of witchcraft were often very much related to the idea of woman stepping out of the role that was deemed appropriate for her as woman. So this is, this is in part a, a history of, quote unquote, knowing your place. I was going to say, in, in, imposed by men, but also, and you write about this, imposed by women too. Yes, but I, I, I just want to uh, say a few more words about it. it. Was a history of knowing your place. So, uh, in in the seventeenth century, um, women were accused of being sinful by uh, stepping out of their role as woman. Um, in the eighteenth century, they were accused of being unnatural by stepping out of their role as women. In the 19th century, they were accused of being manly or strong-minded or Amazonian. Amazonian was an accusation in the 18th century too, and it was not a compliment. And in the 20th century, they were accused of being lesbians or dykes when they stepped out of their role as women. But it, it seems that the accusation that that uh, tried to put woman in her place always had to do with her uh, taking a role that that challenged what was um, uh, so called womanly, what was traditional. The word, but, the word. We'll, we'll come back to my previous question. I, I, but but actually, you 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 you've made me think of a different question. Uh, the word dyke was that a pejorative? It was certainly a pejorative. Uh, there's there's been a lot of discussion among linguists uh, where it came from, and perhaps initially it might not have been uh, a pejorative term. There was a uh, a phrase all diked out, which meant uh, very fancy men's clothes. So maybe it came from there initially in the early twentieth century. Uh, but then it it uh, came to mean uh, someone who was sexually inappropriate as well as inappropriate in terms of gender. In the 1970s, radical lesbian feminists took that term and reversed uh, the pejorative aspect of it. It became what radical lesbian feminists saw of as a positive term, a strong term. And I think that radical lesbian feminists learned that from uh, uh, African Americans. Uh, black used to be a pejorative term, uh, and African Americans claimed that term as positive and strong in the 1960s. And I think that lesbians learned that about the term dyke, just as um, LGBTQ people learned that about the term queer. 
in the 1990s. It was a term meant to insult uh, LGBTQ people. LGBTQ, of course, was not a term in the 1990s. And um, uh, people who would now identify in that category began to call themselves queer as a matter of reclaiming that term. And again, getting to this idea of know your place, and you talked about the evolution of that earlier. And and I originally was going to say, well, it's something that's been imposed by men, but when you write about this, it's also been historically imposed by by women too. Yes, I, I think that women have often been complicit in the idea of woman as it was first defined in the 17th century and continued to be to be defined in the 18th and 19th and even uh, in the 20th century. And sometimes again, as we will hopefully uh, uh, talk about later on, was so interesting to me to discover that there was a a huge anti-suffrage movement, anti-woman suffrage movement beginning in the 19th century. And women were very active in that anti-woman suffrage movement. Um, they, they made statements such as, we, we don't want to trouble ourselves with uh, politics. We don't want to have to study um, uh, political questions. We leave that to our husbands and our brothers and our fathers. And when they vote, they keep us in mind. They vote for us too. Women don't need the vote. Keep women in the protected home, they said. And of course, the the same thing was true even into the 20th century in the uh, 1970s with the um, Equal Rights Amendment and Phyllis Schlafly and the Eagle Forum. They made the same kind of argument. Women don't want equal rights. We already have special privileges. We have our protected homes and we want to stay in the protected home. We don't want to compete with men in the world. So, yes, I I think it's true that um, women have often been complicit in maintaining this notion of woman as it was first defined for white women in the 17th century. Were were the anti-suffragettes, were were they powerful? Were they a powerful force against the suffragettes? You know, there there, uh, were chapters of various uh, anti-women suffrage movements all over the United States, and they didn't give up. Even uh, as late as uh, 1919 and 1920, when the uh, uh, amendment was ratified, they were still talking about how this is terrible for for women. Uh, Women should not have to worry about the vote. They shouldn't have to worry about political decisions. They should have to worry only about their home and their children and their husbands. And so... Yes, the anti-suffrage movement, women's suffrage movement continued uh, even when it was clear that women were going to get the vote. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Lillian Faderman. Lillian Faderman is Professor Emerita at California State University, Fresno, and she is the author of many books. Her latest that we are in conversation about is called Woman, the American History of an Idea. Lillian Faderman as I and as we've talked about how this is in part a history of men and women trying to put women in quote unquote in their place, it's also obviously a history of women who refuse to be uh, put in their place. And as you were talking about the anti suffragettes, there it reminded me as you also write about when there is pro- there is progress in, in this history that you tell for women, but it's not a linear progress. You can go forward. And you can go backwards, just as you were talking about how the anti-suffragettes, suffragettes, even after uh, the the equal voting right, the voting rights, uh, the the women suffragette suffrage voting rights was uh, enshrined in the Constitution. They kept fighting afterwards, and and it's kind of what we're seeing even today with with Roe v. Wade. Uh, we opened up the our, our phone lines on one of our recent shows after the news came out about the Supreme Court draft uh, of overturning Roe v. Wade. And a young woman called in uh, and, and her, her she said, you know, I always thought this would be something that would be legal. This was something that we wouldn't really have to worry about, that this is so sacrosanct. And, and I felt that way, too. Like, oh, no, overturning Roe v. Wade 
wouldn't be one of those things that could happen. But again, it's, it's part of this sort of history that you tell of progress is not always linear. It goes forward, but it also goes back after it goes forward. Yes, and I, I think that that's been true throughout our history as the United States. But I, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, tracing how it happened in the 20th century, just consistently throughout the 20th century. So in the 1920s, many women were in the workforce. About a third of college students were were women. And then the Depression happened, and women were, were urged again back into the home. And they were told that women's place was in the home, and, and true women should not want to take jobs away from men who had uh, families to support. And in 1940, uh, 41, the war happened. And again, it was a seesaw. <laughs> Women were told that, of course, they had to get out there into the workforce. Of course, they had to help in the war effort by working in, in factories. And uh, of course, they were welcomed into various military branches to, uh, to free up men to fight in combat. Um, there was the famous Rosie the Riveter image, obviously, and the war was over. And again, the, the seesaw women were urged back into the home. And that was the era of what Betty Friedan has famously called the feminine mystique, where women were told that true women did not want to be in the workforce, did not want to be independent. All they wanted was to be wives and mothers. And then the, the feminist movement happened and women fought hard to get women into the workforce and to increase women's uh, independence in, in various ways. But in the 1980s, there was again a retreat to the home. And I think it was because of what uh, Arlie Hochschild, the sociologist has um, called the second shift, that is uh, men, saw it as women's jobs, their wives' jobs to, um, certainly it was okay if they went out and made money, but they also had to come home, do the housework, uh, take responsibility for the uh, children. They were doing the second shift. And as Arlie Hochschild observed, men's contribution to the house was to walk the dog and fix the car. <laughs> And um, that that uh, we got over that again. Women went back into the workforce, but I think they were very troubled by the fact that uh, it was so difficult to arrange for child care. And even at the beginning of this millennium, there was again a movement called the Opt Out Revolution to send women back to the home, and many women were complicit. There was, for instance, a fascinating article in the New York Times um, in which the uh, uh, journalist interviewed several women who were members of a woman's book group, all of them ex-lawyers, all of them with fancy degrees from Harvard and Yale and Princeton who had opted out. They returned to the home. They, um, they, they spoke in terms that would have been very familiar to the Puritans about who woman was. Uh, they talked about how it's, it's natural for women to want to be wives and mothers and to cherish the home. And why should they worry about um, high powered jobs? They had come to a place where they could admit that woman was different from men and they were very happy to uh, to give up their fancy credentials and making partner in law firms and and go back to women's traditional role and then the man session happened in 2008 and their husbands were losing jobs uh, in the 2008 man session it was predominantly men who lost their jobs uh, jobs in construction jobs in in investment uh, jobs that were dominated by men women had to go back into the workforce and and they did many of them gladly by 2019 uh, women's participation in the workforce was just about equal to men's participation in the workforce salaries were rising for uh, women and, and uh, all socioeconomic levels, um, uh, women with uh, 
college degrees were making something like 92% of what men made. That was incredible considering where we had come from. And then COVID happened. Yeah. And again, um, women not only lost their jobs disproportionately, particularly uh, working class women who were in jobs like uh, hospitality, um, but uh, also middle class women lost their jobs disproportionately. Or if they could work from home, if they could telecommute, they were still in trouble because they had disproportionate responsibility for the children because they couldn't rely on uh, daycare. Uh, daycare centers were closed, of course, for a period of time uh, because of COVID. So it, it's been a seesaw. It looks now um, as though um, uh, women have uh, gone back to the progress they were making um, on, on all socioeconomic levels. Uh, but of course, that, uh, that can't be relied on. Something may happen yet again to send women uh, back to where they were in earlier decades. And what uh, may happen to Roe v. Wade, and right now it looks as though that's a pretty sure bet it will be uh, repealed by the Supreme Court, um, that, that's an indication that, yes, we're still on a seesaw. Do these backlashes, and I don't know if that's the appropriate term or not, but when you're talking about the 80s, that's, that's what I was thinking. is like, oh, he has another backlash in the, in the 80s and uh, to the progress that's always, always been made. And, and I think we see that in a lot of social movements when there's progress made, there inevitably comes a, a backlash afterwards. But does that backlash also cause another backlash against it? Because I do suspect that if the Supreme Court is to move forward, and maybe there's other examples, different examples in history here, if the Supreme Court does go forward to overturn Roe v. Wade, that would actually be a galvanizing force as well yes, in the women's I, movement. I think you're absolutely right. It, it seems that it's it's been uh, consistently, certainly throughout the 20th century and even into our century, it's been consistently two steps forward one step back, but that two steps forward, uh, they, they've put us ahead. And I, I think there certainly will be a, a huge reaction on the part of American women if Roe v. Wade is, is indeed overturned. How about in the past? Did you, did you see after the backlash to women's progress, a struggle that was then born out of that? Yes, and, and the most notable example, of course, is the birth of the second wave of the feminist movement, uh, fighting against the feminine mystique that uh, overtook America right after World War II. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think the backlash of the feminine mystique sending Rosie the Riveter and her sisters back home uh, finally caused another backlash of the powerful second wave of the feminist movement. In your survey of this long history, uh, several hundred years, going back to the 17th century, is, is there a period of time that you could look at and say this might have been the biggest rupture that had occurred? The biggest rupture uh, in the sense From the status of, quo, from, from how things were before? You no, know, I... I, I think there are a number of incidents that ruptured the status quo. One that I that I found uh, so fascinating uh, was perhaps one of the first um, social uh, forces that ruptured the status quo. So uh, America, United States was established as a country. And of course, men had to go about building the new country and the job was left to the men or assigned to the men. Women were to make homes for the men while they troubled their head with uh, building the new country. Um, women were told that they did indeed have special roles. That, that is that they, they had to, with their superior virtue, their morality, because they uh, they weren't driven by men's often uncontrollable appetites. They had to teach men how to be better. And what was meant by that, of course, is they had to uh, 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 imbue their sons with morality. 
Um, I, I discovered that in a number of sources beginning in the 1790s and certainly in the uh, uh, early 19th century uh, newspaper accounts and, and ministers asking women to step up to their job, to take their role because of their, their superior uh, moral virtue, the fact that they uh, they didn't have these drives that men had that often made them, quote, sinful. Uh, women had a role in the New Republic. But women took that seriously, and they decided that they would um, get rid of prostitution, for instance, and they began to form moral reform societies on a national level all over the the country beginning in the um, 1830s. Um, and they they did things that were unprecedented for the notion of woman. They stepped out of their home. They uh, formed these organizations. In some cases, uh, as a group, they invaded houses of prostitution to sing hymns to the uh, sinful fornicators. Um, they they took on a, a role that women had never taken on before. They urged the legislatures all over the country to pass laws against men who seduced innocent women. Um, they were successful in getting those laws passed uh, almost everywhere in the United States in a relatively new country. They, um, they, also believed that they had superior virtue in terms of um, the demon drink. And so they formed temperance societies all over the country. Again, they organized as women never really had on a large scale before. Almost um, every state had a temperance society. They were often women-led temperance societies. They did very unwomanly things like uh, long before Carrie Nation in the early 20th century, in the 19th century, in the 1840s, they invaded saloons with hatchets and they um, uh, broke into these um, barrels of of liquor. And they um, I I love one story that I tell where um, they invaded one saloon and and a a woman said to a man who was drinking, get out of here. And he said, let me at least finish my drink. Will you do that? And she said, no, I I would rather uh, brain you with this hatchet and send you to heaven sober. (laughs) Very unwomanly kind of speech. And so it was fascinating to me that that, um, what was supposedly um, men's urging women to be the epitome of woman uh, to to uh, help men become more moral, uh, to help men control their appetites uh, was actually women's entrance into the world. And eventually, they they claimed that they were still doing housekeeping. They were doing housekeeping on a large scale, and eventually, uh, it, this housekeeping on a large scale, municipal housekeeping, became some of the first. Uh, of the paid professions for middle-class women. They became social workers. They uh, took an active role um, in the late 19th and early 20th century in helping to form public policy. But I trace that back to what happened in the uh, late 18th, early 19th century with women being told that they um, they had a superior morality that they had to imbue in the men of their family. So, so you see a connection to that with the, the birth of of a notion, a modern notion that we all now recognize today, but it's not some ancient notion that of social work. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, the first social workers uh, were women who uh, were doing housekeeping on a large scale. And indeed, Jane Addams, the founder of Hull House, who was a pioneer social worker in the late 19th and early 20th century said it as much. It, it was woman's role to to help the poor, to uh, to establish uh, uh, legislation for uh, children. Um, I I would even go as far as to suggest that some of our best legislation came through that impulse was established during uh, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration. 
um, and some of the leaders in urging Roosevelt to establish that legislation were women who had been um, active in the early social work movement, such as Frances Perkins, the first woman to hold a cabinet position, the Secretary of Labor. Um, she urged FDR uh, towards uh, Social Security, which was passed in 1935. Eleanor Roosevelt herself had been very active in some of these early women's betterment movements in the um, uh, early 20th century. And I think through women that she worked with in the betterment movements, such as uh, Molly Dusen, for instance, um, uh, in groups such as the Women's Trade Union League, um, she was able to get FDR uh, to think about these policies that became so much a part of the New Deal. Frances Perkins, such a great example. Even before she joined FDR's cabinet as Secretary of, of Labor, first woman secretary in, in a cabinet, uh, she was working in, in New York, uh, and New York's government, New York City, she was working with, with immigrant workers. Uh, she was yes, just outside where the triangle uh, uh, shirt waist fire occurred. Fire, yes, yes, yes. And also working um, with settlement houses and very much influenced by Jane Addams. So there's a real connection, I think, between FDR's wonderful policies and the New Deal and these early women reformers of the uh, uh, early decades of the 20th century. It was interesting to hear about the entryways into women organizing, and you mentioned sort of anti-prostitution efforts. And, and of course, if we were to put that in today's context, it would, it would be pretty controversial, as there are serious debates, including among women groups, about sex work. Yes, and, and uh, sex-positive uh, women feminists. Uh, there was something that was called the sex wars in the 1980s with uh, uh, radical feminists who were uh, very opposed to pornography, for instance, uh, and wanted to pass legislation against pornography and sex-positive feminists who uh, fought them and... Uh, were very much on the side of women sex workers and um, worried even about banning pornography and what that meant for freedoms, women's freedoms as well as men's freedoms. So it's certainly been a very complex issue. And one that has evolved back that to the 19th evolved. century. Yes. Um, and of course, the uh, so much uh, of the Me Too movement uh, has to do with asserting uh, women's rights to uh, say no when um, when they're displeased about uh, uh, men's harassment. Um, how, how do you see the Me Too movement in, in history? And has there been another anything like that before? I, I've been fascinated by the Me Too movement and, and the um, history of uh, women's uh, true accusations against their harassers. Uh, I talk about these medical doctors of the early 20th century who uh, insisted that uh, often women's so-called accusations came out of hysteria or um, changing their minds uh, about uh, what was first consensual um, or uh, simply disliking a man and wanting to get him in trouble. Medical doctors seldom would not believe women who accused men. Um, the, the Me Too movement uh, sort of reversed this. It was the first time that women as a group said, uh, you have to listen to us. This this has happened not just to me, but it's ubiquitous. And of course, the internet was a huge aid mm -hmm. in um, in spreading word of, of the movement and the proliferation of the movement. Um, I, I love it that uh, in uh, 2017, we had the, the largest uh, uh, one-day demonstration 
ever against uh, the harasser in chief. Um, uh, and women wore uh, pussy hats to uh, to remind the harasser in chief that uh, this would not go, that they were calling men and particularly him on their um, uh, harassment of women. Um, yeah, Trump so was like the backlash, and then we got the bash backlash to him, kind of that dynamic we were talking about earlier. Yes. I yes. remember being in Washington, D.C. on that day. I, I could hardly move. I remember yeah. being on the platform on a metro station. It was kind of scary because the platforms are really narrow, and you know there are people right at the edge of it. I mean, I, I, I used to live in Washington, D.C. I was a Capitol reporter. I went back to cover the, 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 the beginning of the Trump administration, and like my second day there was that, that day of the— of the protest, and I, I had never seen that many people in one place before. Yeah, yeah, it, it was interesting to me that um, women who accused men of sexual harassment or sexual abuse, even into the 1990s, were so often not believed. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly of Anita Hill and her accusation of Clarence Thomas um, during the uh, uh, Senate Judiciary confirmation hearings and how polls showed that uh, most Americans simply did not believe Anita Hill. I think that that would no longer be the case. I, I think that because of the Me Too movement, America realizes how ubiquitous sexual harassment is, and Anita Hill's story would have been considered much more plausible than it was in the 1990s. But one of the good parts, if, if something uh, like that, what ultimately I think we have to see is a tragedy, certainly for women's rights, for Roe v. Wade, for instance. One of the good parts of that is it brought about the third wave of the women's movement, with women again waking up and, and saying, uh, women will never be equal if they are harassed in the workplace. And that really triggered uh, the women's movement that, that seemed to be in hiatus in the 1980s. In the 1990s, it woke up yet again. And it just feels like it's about to get some more fuel. Yep. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, which is the upside, I suppose, of... of the terrible thing that may happen in the Supreme Court, that uh, women will again wake up and, and realize that we can't let our guard down. We have to keep fighting for our rights or they'll be revoked. Lillian Faderman has been our guest. Lillian Faderman is a renowned scholar of lesbian history and literature. She's the author of a number of books. She has joined us for a conversation on her latest. It's called Woman, the American History of an idea. Lillian Faderman, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Oh, have I, Mitch. Thank you for inviting me.